Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number 99 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is Xuan Lu, a professional poker player born in China, raised in Canada with over $2.7 million in total career tournament earnings, both live and online combined. She is the only woman to final table the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure main event when she finished fourth back in 2012. In recent years, Xuan had ad has added a poker commentator and poker power instructor to her resume. And on today's show, we're going to get to know her a little better. Xuan, welcome to the Cards Chat podcast. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Cards Chat community. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's good to meet you. Yours is uh, a name and a face I've followed for many years, never had the chance really to interact with, uh, save for this last week where we're coordinating uh, what day and time to record. Uh, so this is a nice opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Such a pleasure. Cool. Um, okay, so according to our research, there's an article you wrote for Insider. And back in the day, you were just seven years old. You were setting up poker games for stuffed animals. How did you, how did you have such an early exposure to poker? Yeah, so I've always loved games as a kid. Um, my parents uh, went to Canada before I did, so I was, I was kind of raised by my grandma and uh, my cousins and and oftentimes I would be left alone, but I remember some of my most vivid happy memories were like watching my uh, paternal grandma um, in like the courtyard playing Mahjong with her friends. And those were like the, some of the happiest times she had because, you know, back in these very traditional um, uh, societies and arrangements, you know, the women would have to do most of the household labor and cooking and all that. And that was really the time where I saw them like, gather and be social and have fun um and so like I think I wanted to to um replicate that in my own life as well and um I, I love playing Chinese chess and chess and you know go and checkers and all that when I was a kid and, and poker was just one of the outlets for me um but poker unlike the other games are you know there's an element of um, incomplete information that I was always fascinated by even as a young child and I would um you know set up stuffed animals and I would try to um empathize and put myself in each of the animals shoes to think what you know how they would act given the information that they had um and obviously I think that was a really useful exercise and just based on the way I was brought up um I was taught always to be you know more observant and um a better listener than um so I just had these like natural skills uh, from from the get-go I guess that's super cool. And yet I'm still left with the question, how is it that poker, you said it was just one of those games. Who is it that was playing poker? Where did you see it played and that you learned the rules and say, oh, okay, I want to also do that with my stuffed animals in addition to the other games you mentioned? Yeah, so honestly, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but when I was quite young, there was this um, Hong Kong blockbuster called God of Gamblers that mm -hmm. came out with uh, Chow Yun-Fat and Andy Lau, and those were two of my favorite actors. Mm -hmm. um, I had a big crush on them growing up, and they had this series that really resonated with me. And obviously, there's a huge po uh, portion of the movie that's like just pure degenerate gambling but I, I really like the poker element and mm. they weren't playing Texas Hold'em or anything it was more um, sure. I, I believe it was like stud or stud high low or something mm -hmm. um it's been ages but um yeah and and like I said the mahjong aspect as well just I was always close to games whether it was like arcade games or sports or yeah right my blood. for sure uh you know a lot of folks you know you you know you hear growing up how they got into poker or whatever it is and you say oh how did your family react to that sort of thing I am wondering you know it is just a, a known thing that in Chinese culture gambling is almost you know intertwined with it it's it's a big part it's certainly not frowned upon so to speak was that true in your family as well um I would say that it's very polarized in Chinese culture mm. it's either um your family or your you know, social circle leans into it a mm. bit more and are more on the degenerate side, <laughs> or they're complete opposite. They're very, you know, studious, academically focused people who sure. frown upon that circle. You know, like um, 
Chinese culture is not just one huge, uh, you know, hegemonic of like, course. force. Just like any other culture, like even in the West, there's people who, you know, feel uh, differently on every spectrum of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sometimes it's it's beneficial to lean into that degenerate image. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely say my, my family is actually on the more conservative side. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't really support me and, and still to this day have okay. lots of hesitations about it. Um, and it took them, you know, a long time to come around. That's interesting. So yeah, I want to sort of dive into that a little bit. You know, you did go to university, University of Waterloo. Um, just first of all, what was your major? What, what was the original thoughts before poker sunk its teeth into you? Honestly, I was super idealistic growing up. Um, <laughs> I didn't really know, like I didn't. So I, I probably had quite a contentious upbringing, especially as a teenager, but mm. I, I'd always been very good at school. Um, and I was able to go to Waterloo mostly, you know, with um, a scholarship and bursaries and most of my funds covered, but I had to maintain a certain grade. Nice. And initially I went there um, because they gave me the most uh, assistance uh, mm -hmm. for social development studies, which I was very interested in. It was an interdisciplinary um, program uh, that focused on like psychology, social sciences, and political science. Um, however, shortly, you know, after the first year, I wasn't able to maintain my grades partially because I was playing too much poker. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I lost that opportunity and I, ha I had to work even harder to make money in poker so I could pay tuition and things like that. So, right. um, it, it wasn't the best cycle to be in, but I, I still wouldn't trade my university experience for anything. So what is it that you feel you got most out of that if not necessarily the education and the degree, but from the university experience, what did you enjoy most and that stuck with you? You know, be, because I went to school for something, for topics that I was interested in, I still feel like I got a lot out of my education, even mm. though I didn't get, you know, the best grades. Okay. Um, and even though I don't actually have too many friends from that stage in my life, because um, it was a tough time for me overall and you know I was a bad student um but overall I think you know the social aspect I wouldn't trade for anything um and and just just the experience I think is still very invaluable I mean these days you can learn anything on Coursera and a plethora of like online education platforms but um yeah there's nothing quite like you know e even though at that time I didn't really feel like I belonged um it, it still was a very valuable experience interesting and you said you were playing a lot of poker you were also dealing if uh if, uh, if I understand correctly yeah okay um, so so you, and you did a license up, for that it, so there were parts of it um different elements um when I first learned about Texas Hold'em I completely Fell in love. I mean, not entirely true. When I first learned, it was when I was about 16 that I had this um, boyfriend who was 18 at the time. And I vividly remember this one time he went to the charity casino and obviously I wasn't of age and I had to wait outside for him for like three hours while he like was in there playing limit hold him. Oh, but, you know, I didn't know how the game worked or anything at the time. Um, it wasn't until I was in university when the moneymaker effect uh, happened. And I referenced this a lot as, you know, sort of the, I guess, the callus for a lot of my, my peers as well, uh, falling in love with the game. Um, and for me, I, I was definitely more of an opportunist. Um, I I saw it, how um, deep of a cultural effect it had, and how much my friends would want to gamble. And and I always all also like assumed that um, the guys on team they weren't doing anything that insightful or anything I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, so I studied a, a lot. I read basically every poker book there was at the time. Um, and I kept on looking for poker opportunities, which is why um, I I did deal. I ran my home my own home game. Um, I dealt in a few undergrounds. Um, I also dealt at the CNE, which is like uh, the Canadian National Exhibition. It's like a fair they have every year. Cool. There's a like a pretty notable charity casino there. Um, so I was a dealer the first year, and then I was like a floor supervisor the second year. Um, but that was all limit poker and and really from from that 
time frame of my life, I just wanted to immerse myself in all things poker. Um, so you're yeah. saying, you know, I'm, I'm just like, I'm also interested in the context here. Like at that stage, were you saying to yourself, okay, I want to make a living from this game. Like I see that that's possible and just see where it takes me. Or as you also saying, you know, you had lost the, you know, sort of financial support from the university. Was it just to also sort of pay for that, that you know, as, as being as a, uh, a poker employee? I, I would definitely say both. Um, mm. I, I've always had jobs growing up. You know, I, I came from an immigrant family and my parents were very, very hard, but not enough to, you know, sort of sustain um, also the lifestyle that I wanted. So mm. I knew I, I had to sort of make it out on my own. Um, and at that point I, I felt like I was already kind of disillusioned by you know the traditional career trajectory that um, a lot of my peers took um you know I was never going to be a studio system I, I wasn't just gonna like go to Ireland and become like a you know accountant or something um and and so as I mentioned I, I was always looking for opportunities to make money but also I just love the game so much mm. um it didn't feel like work to me at, right. at any point um, and, and yeah, I didn't really think too far down the road into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, obviously I didn't tell my parents for a long time that I was spending a significant amount of time playing poker. Right. Um, they, you know, after I graduated, I actually was, uh, swing trading with, um, my stepfather for a bit and, and had it go for a positive experience there, even though, um, you know, I, I questioned a lot of the mythology. Mm -hmm um involved and um honestly poker was a lot less stressful for me mm -hmm. and felt a lot less gambling um mm -hmm. and yeah I it doesn't matter like what I would be working on I was always sort of like revert back to poker in my spare time that's very cool you mentioned there one particular word I want to you know sort of harp on you said it was not the lifestyle that I wanted for myself so it was the freedom no, because poker can be pretty stressful. And, you know, as much as you didn't yeah. want to do that other stuff, you you recognized also early on, there's still a lot of study that you have to do mm -hmm. for poker. It's not just to you know, wake up and, you know, become an instant millionaire. So what sort of lifestyle were you after? Yeah, you nailed it um, when you said the word freedom. Um, mm. For me, it's always been about autonomy, um, not having to rely on other people. Mm. Um, even though, like, Later on, I would soon realize that's also like a very flawed thought process. Um, I I guess like as a kid and a teenager, I never really got comfortable with like asking for things that I needed, and um, and yeah, poker was just like a way for me to have that freedom, and be able to travel, which was another thing I wanted to do. Um, yeah, just all the things that um. You know, I didn't have a clear vision of what my life, what I wanted that to be, but okay. um, I knew it didn't, I didn't want like that, you know, basic traditional pathway. Nothing wrong with that. And honestly, I think people who do want that tend to be, you know, probably happier um, in a lot of respects, but um, I just couldn't do it sure. at that oh. age. Yeah, all, all due respect to that. I mean, but what we typically do, you know, like what I would do with any pro, like looking, uh, you know, to ask some questions about their career, always look at the Hendon mob. And I see around, you know, 2010, that's when you start recording results. But like, it's just like you dove straight into the deep end. You know, you're playing in big <laughs> tournaments and you're traveling. I mean, usually you kind of have to work your way up. So I'm guessing you built your bankroll online first. I did. Okay. Um, so when... So I started off online playing cash games, um, sit and goes, and I was on the leaderboards for the sit and goes, one battle of the planets. Um, then when FTP Rush Poker came out, um, I was uh, one of the top winners of like one, two for, mm. you know, a while. And um, so so I've had these like, like reasonable online results um, and yeah, barely no tournament experience whatsoever, but it was... Um, a close friend at the time who really encouraged me to to sell action on to pursue mm. um, and post my graphs and you know initially it's just for like 1ks and 2ks um, but I, as I mentioned I also was like doing decently in this swing trading aspect and so um, 
And my, my mom at the time, like realized how much this meant to me. And so she offered to give me like in a one year, like retreat, even though it was more of an ultimatum, wow. she basically said, you can take one year off and like go travel and play poker. Um, but after the end of the year, you know, you know, you, you have to like get a real job and settle right. down kind of thing. Um, and so I, I, you know, it was basically like, fuck bankroll management. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I have this finite time, so I'm going to make the most of it. And I took a bunch of shots and so a lot of action and, uh, and did really well that year. Had like two, you know, 500 K scores in, in less than a year. So, yeah. um, was able to convince her to, to let me keep playing for a while. So. I mean, we all know uh, serious recreationals as well as pros that you're not necessarily supposed to be results oriented. And I imagine even then that's something that you knew. And yet you find yourself kind of like having to convince your mom based on the results. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like, cause like, Hey, look, see, I did it. You know, that sort of a thing. And that's legitimate, you know, considering what your goals were um, at any point. I mean, is, is it possible, you know, when, there is such a, I don't know, divergence in expectations from, you know, parents to, to a child to say, you know, okay, it's, you know, maybe, okay, I convinced you that first year, but now it's not necessarily going to be like that every year, but I, I'm telling you, I'm better than I was like, I'm better than I was last year or five years ago. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would have mattered. Mm. The, the only one time where they were like, okay, maybe this is, kind of an okay path for you was um when I was invited to WPT China in Sanya one year and and invited them to come with me and they saw my poster on this mural and then they were like oh like I guess this is kind of a thing uh -huh. like, that you can <laughs> sustain right um you know at that time I didn't really know how long I wanted to do it for either like I even then I, I wouldn't have called myself a professional um, oh, wow. I, okay. I don't think I would call myself a professional now, to be honest. I don't, you know, grind. I don't uh, put in a ton of hours and um, I'm, I work on many other things as well. And I, I took several years off. Um, right. But yeah, I, I guess because of um, the experience and, and certain results, it's hard to to come out of that box. That's interesting. That's, that's very interesting. Like to me, and to a lot of people, professional basically means, well, this is how I make my living primarily, right? And that, right. that makes me a professional player. Whereas, again, take call me on it if I'm taking a little bit of a leap here. It's much more of a means to that end of freedom for you. And that's why it's yes. not as important to grind, like, you know, as much as a professional, quote unquote, would. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and, you know, I if you did pay attention to my um in the mom there there was definitely a lull um in in play and results for for many years and yeah. um you know due to personal reasons I didn't think I was gonna come back into the poker world but hmm. um yeah uh saying seriously um I'm somehow back and uh, I, I guess I'm happier than ever and I think my game is as good as ever um but I, I still wouldn't say I, I do it full time. Hmm. Interesting. I see now I'm conflicted. I do it because I have a couple <laughs> questions about that. Do we just jump straight sure. there? Maybe we do. And then we'll just go backwards. Um, so you took these two breaks, you know, that we noticed it was, uh, let's see, I had the notes here. Exactly. It was from summer 2017 to 2019. And again, from fall 2019 to 2021. And you've talked about specifically the, mental and physical toll that the game took on you and yet you know here you are back cashing at the wpt more recently at the ept it's just ah you know poker you know there's, there's no such thing as really retiring or taking a break it's always gonna call to you is that what it is or it's just okay it's you know time to make some more right now to maintain the lifestyle i've gotten accustomed to no honestly i was you know very much into an entirely different industry um, up mm. until the time I most recently came back again. Um, yeah, so so before the 2017 break, I, I was honestly super burnt out. Um, 
I didn't, I just didn't really enjoy the game anymore. And I was hmm. um, sucked into a lot of bad habits, I would say. And I was kind of disillusioned by the whole industry and the people and like, honestly, like quite depressed for a lot of it. And then I got uh, married and um, when that didn't work out um, and because they were very much in the poker world, it, you know, I, I just wanted to take a big step away from everything. Right. And um, it was just way too hard for me. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I am very blessed because even though I was sort of out of the industry, I, I was still sort of getting opportunities to do um, commentating in, in Chinese and, and um, just like, uh, especially with poker power, um, yeah. someone told me about it, and you know, even though I wasn't really playing poker anymore, like um, you know, poker uh, fundamentals is you know is the thing I probably know best um, in the world, and and so like teaching and and hearing about the cause really got me excited um, to be a part of you know that project. And um, just one thing led to another, and, and then they're like, "Hey, do you want to play on high stakes poker?" And, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. You know, you, you don't put the game the the game puts you, as they say. Interesting. No, it's like you know, you touched on exactly the types of topics uh, I wanted to talk about and and ask questions about. I want to just sort of try and draw a line here, though, with you know, I don't know if that respect to, but in spite of perhaps all of those things that were going on in your life, did you and do you still maintain that sort of basic love that you had for the game as far as that competitive element? Is that still alive within you? A hundred percent. And now more than ever, um, it, you know, my initial success, um, not like the grindy online stuff that um, I've done as well, but just my live tournament success, I would say like was very fluky and I had, so much imposter syndrome for, for good reasons, right? Um, you know, I had these scores without really studying much tournament poker and just um, learning most of it through osmosis of like the very talented groups I was hanging out with at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but now, um, you know, especially, I, I would say I didn't really have like that much self-confidence, like up until like a few years ago, like it was, it, it took a lot for me to completely rebuild um, my sense of self worth and and all that and and I think that has actually been the number one thing that's helped my poker game the most. Um, you know, for a long time I was questioning, you know, my life direction and uh, my poker skills and and all of that. You know how tournament variants can be, sure. which is honestly <laughs> probably a, a good thing. Um, at the time, um, I, I didn't want to fall my way upwards to success. Um, and now I know like I deserve to have the opportunities um, and and have that level of success. So I'm a lot happier as well. Hmm. Now, we won't get into more poker power questions, but just to sort of dip my toe into it, based on what you said, you know, when you're instructing someone, you're not that I've ever taught someone poker, but when you're in general providing instruction to someone, they're looking to you as a teacher who obviously knows the fundamentals of the game, knows how to play it, the strategies, that sort of thing. But every poker teacher, uh, every instructor, every mentor has that lifetime career, uh, you know, wealth of experience to draw on. And yours is certainly unique. Um, in what way do you feel that your experiences influence the way you instruct your their, your pupils uh, at Poker Power? Um, so the cool thing about Poker Power is that um, the main curriculum is built entirely for beginners. And so you have all these, you know, um, interested, intelligent women from all different walks of life who don't necessarily know anything about poker. Um, and I think, you know, obviously, to be honest, playing, uh, having played poker at a very high level um, might be a, like overkill for most of that curriculum. Um, having said that, you know, poker power instructors, they, they all have super unique stories, you know, like because women make such like a small percentage um, of the community, sure. like almost every single one of them has like a super unique, profound mm. story of how they got there. 
Um, so I don't necessarily think mine is, you know, so different. Um, you know, the other players on the board have, all have very impressive results. Um, and Melanie Weisner, who designed the curriculum, um, you know, she's been in the industry way longer than I have. It was one of the reasons um, why I, I took those shots in tournaments. Like she used to, you know, she was one of the people who bought my action um, uh -huh. when I was uh, a complete nobody at the time. So, um, so yeah, I, I guess it's all about just like paying it forward um, mm. and uh, yeah, trying to get as many women, not necessarily to become like, professional poker players or whatever but just like to to have a glimpse of how deep and exciting and interesting this game can be cool i love it um you know i couldn't help but notice on that uh the hand and mob those results and i'm a big mixed game fan and i saw that you know um uh, unlike many uh your results were not just limited to no limit hold'em you have a cash in a 558 game mix you have a seven card stud result you have a horse result i like it a big fan always promoting the mixed games so you know what is it that said you know made you want to branch outside of hold them you know what you saw on tv from the moneymaker area and say i'm going to try these other games too yeah as i mentioned i've, I've always loved like different variations of games and at the time um you know i was playing i had like a 30 or 40 events wsop schedule um and like i i would i had some experience playing um mostly like 510 on stars um mm. cash games mix but like otherwise like wsop was like basically the only time i got to play but always had a good time you know my my only wsop final table is in that next game um and i met some really fun people who like helped me uh study along the way as well um and i think i i hung out with some of the best mixed players at the time um so it was just like a natural progression for me and, and it's so nice to break up the the monotony of no limit as well once Preach. in a while yes <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I recently stopped mostly uh, because I, I think mixed game players have gotten a lot better and I'm very behind on the studying. Um, and, and so while I also play like, you know, low stakes sometimes, I think, yeah, I'll need to put in a lot of work before um, I play those seriously again. Okay. And plus no limit prize pools are just like so incredible these days and like, there's three or four tournaments you can play in any given day and even though you know i would love to fit in a mixed game like i would have to bust like five or six bullets to like have that opportunity on a given day so it just makes that hard for sure for sure so where do cash games sort of fit in how much cash do you play versus tournaments in general um so it's honestly been quite different every year um i would say because i'm trying to get in on um, more stream games i just think they're so much fun and you know to me that's not um, only a grind that's also you know um elevating and, and sending out like the poker power message and um, other things i'm working on I'm, I'm just very spoiled these days um um so i would say Although I was in Barcelona and I played a lot of tournaments, um, maybe about half and half. Okay. So with tournaments, it's more, I don't know, competitive, want to get titles. And with cash games, it's more, you know, want to, you know, advertise. Enough for, that sounds crass almost, but like spread the message, I guess, of, of poker power and, yeah. you know, on the live streams. And they're just so much fun. Uh -huh. Yeah. Nice. And like okay. like what Hustler and you know Live at the Bike and all these streams are doing, it's it's so exciting to be a part of that. Um, yeah, I think it's a new golden age of poker for sure. I love it. Very cool. Well, uh, you know, you did mention it already. Uh, you know how you got the opportunity to play on high stakes poker. You know that, and and I have to also admit, you know, when I saw you were in the lineup, I'm like, oh, I don't think I've seen you on high stakes poker before. That's pretty cool. Um, so first of all, how did that happen? Um, and second of all, I mean, you tweeted it was an absolute dream. So can you talk about what that experience was like? Sure. Um, so honestly, it was a complete last minute decision. They had asked me um, several weeks or maybe even a couple of months before the show um, if I wanted to get on. But because I never played cash games even close to that stakes, I, I was really nervous. Um, 
and it you know didn't the show lineup. for what for what it's worth. <laughs> It fooled me. Well, <laughs> well, once I sat down on the table and, you know, looked around, it was like, oh, this is just a poker game. Like, I, I know how these things work. And, okay. you know, I've also played on feature tables before. Um, and, and my attitude going in was honestly, I, I just wanted to have the best time possible, which is why, you know, in that big hand with Jen, even though she, she ended up um, hitting that gunshot and winning, I was still like, I'm just happy to be here, you know, uh, and I'm glad like one of my poker heroes like took down that pot um it, it, and I would say I'm very blessed because that's my general approach to life as well um I, I definitely try to make the most of my situation um obviously I, I sold action uh to that event um but yeah I wasn't gonna play until literally the night before um when you know the organizers showed me the lineup and asked me again and so that they they thought it would be a very good spot, and and so I'm very lucky that I had a network of people um, who believed in me and encouraged me to to take that opportunity. I have to ask, not that you know this is any sort of assumption, but you know you've watched high stakes poker before. I'm sure you know Gentilly sitting there, Patrick Antonius, Doyle Brunson. Was there any? I mean, it's it's over and done with. The session's over, but you've done it. You know, like you looked at the lineup, you said, "Oh my God, I'm going to be sitting here." Was there any at all, little an iota of perhaps intimidation? Um, a hundred percent. I was. I'm always very nervous. Almost, it almost doesn't matter who the lineup is. Um, and just to clarify, I don't mean by the players. I mean just by the. I don't know, center stagedness of, of, of the whole thing. Like this is as high as it gets, basically. Um yes. Um, but I think, like I mentioned, even if it was like a EPT final table or not like a feature table, I, I would have the same amount of nervousness. Mm -hmm. Um, high stakes poker is obviously a big deal, but um, I think I was just at a stage in my life where I couldn't really believe how far I came and I just really wanted to be happy for myself awesome. um yeah and, and make the most of the experience um I can you know hopefully I'll get more opportunities like that in the future but um yeah just want to make the most of it how would a second opportunity be different to you in the way you approach it than the first time I think I would be a lot more prepared um I would have Maybe I would have more money on the table, although I don't think it mattered because I bought in 400k and that was, you know, most of the starting stacks as well. Um, but yeah, maybe doing a little more studying beforehand. Like I said, I, I didn't decide to play until the night though, but um, with some familiar with like some of the line, the lineup. Um, I mean, I knew about Garrett, but I was I felt lucky to have a position on him. Um, and, and some of the other players I actually already played with before. Um, so, you know, it was mostly friendly. Nice. Well, that's good. All right. Well, I do hope you get uh, the chance to do it again. Uh, it was uh, enjoyable as a spectator. I can tell you that. Um, yeah. You talked about commentating. It's an opportunity you've gotten recently. Um, do you enjoy it? To be honest, I'm such a big introvert. It's very tiring for me. Um, I was mostly doing commentating in Mandarin Chinese, which was another element that made me, uh, honestly, commentating is way harder for me than like sitting at a table playing high six poker, <laughs> especially in Chinese. Um, even though I was born in China and um, Ch Mandarin Chinese is my primary language when I speak with my parents, um, there's all this poker vernacular and sure. you know it, it it's not even like I have extensive experience doing commentary in English that like I had it was like a multi-step process that I had to be put on my toes with in, in my head because I had to you know think about what I want to say um you know the the philosophy or the you know um the strategy behind it and then translate it to Chinese and, you know, try also try to filter for like cultural differences and things right. like that. So, right. so yeah, it, it was very tiring. Um, I hope to get better at it, but it is just so difficult to practice um, when I'm playing and not focusing on that. I think it's a super cool thing. I mean, you know, I'm 
intimately familiar with like the Western world of poker, you know, both Europe and North America. Uh, you know, it, it's no secret that, you know, everyone would love to quote unquote penetrate the Chinese market because there's so many people who <laughs> love the game there. Uh, as someone who, you know, obviously has been exposed to it and now has a chance to have a little bit of a, of an influence on it and grow the game a little bit. What can you tell us? I mean, I, I don't really know anything at all. What's unique to the Chinese market of poker players? Um, you know, how much familiarity do they have with Texas Hold'em? Uh, but what can you tell us? Uh, honestly, um, it is a huge market. There's lots of people interested in the game. Um, I think mo a lot of them are mostly attracted to the size of the games. Hmm. So, you know, um, high stakes poker, Hester streams, stuff like that, where there's a lot of action. Um, or dollar amounts that are, you know, often inconceivable to the average viewer sure. uh, is what's exciting for them. Um, because it's a little on the harder side to play there. Um, they have, you know, certain app themes and things like that. It definitely makes it trickier to like really penetrate fully. Sure. Um, and, and honestly, I, I think most cultures are, are like this, but Chinese people like to watch Chinese players as mm -hmm. well. Sure. Um, unless, you know, they're bringing something super unique to the table. Um, and, and, and I'm really impressed with like the new age of like Chinese content that's out there right now. Um, obviously there's a huge market, but um, I would say that it's it's probably still on the harder side to really capitalize on that market as an outsider, e even as, you know, a, a Chinese um, born, mm -hmm. um, like national uh, growing up here, like I'm often treated like an outsider. Interesting. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just the trade off of like how you want to uh, spend your time because unless you have a very good network there already, already there's no guarantee that um, you know the Chinese market will be receptive. Sure. Okay. And then from you, from a more of a personal as well as a professional standpoint, what do you think uh, you gain the most from doing this commentary? Because obviously, you know, if you opportunity comes along and you know it's going to be difficult, as you you've explained. But you do it, obviously. What do you feel has been, you know, the best part uh, of those experiences? Honestly, um, just putting myself out of my comfort zone is a big part of it, hmm. um, and having a deeper grasp of my uh, native tongue has always been a, a big goal of mine. So I think it definitely forces me um, to to put in the work with that as well, and. And yeah, it's, um, like I said, like I wish I was more in touch with my roots uh, very often. And, and, you know, this combines like that element with uh, the game I love the most. So it, it's just, even though it is hard, it's, it's always at the end of the day, it's an enjoyable experience for me. That's super cool. And, and thank you for being so open about that. And, you know, you mentioned uh, you're more uh, introverted. So I have to also just say thank you very much again, uh, that much more so for making the time. Uh, you know, we're nowhere done. We're not done just yet, but I do appreciate, <laughs> uh, you know, you've been so forthcoming and open. I, I'm very much enjoying this conversation. It's uh, pretty cool to hear that stuff from you. I know uh, that uh, after this, you'll be going, uh, you know, to sort of, I guess, calm down from the interview <laughs> to a very exciting event, uh, WNBA Finals. Um, what do you normally do uh, after a commentary session? After you know you got the the wind taken out of your sails, how do you how do you relax and decompress? Honestly, after any sort of public appearance or even like social um, obligation, I just decompress by vegging out, maybe playing video games. Um, you know, the next day I'll do some yoga or, you know, I'll, I like to play team sports as well. So yeah, trying to build good habits, but uh, most of them are like with very small groups or just one other person and myself. Okay, cool. Which, uh, which sports? Um, I, so I grew up uh, playing basketball and volleyball and soccer. Um, these days I play some pickleball and basketball still shoots and hoops. Nice. Um, yeah, just oh. any team sports really uh, get into it. Awesome. And I guess um, that 
social aspect is kind of important beyond obviously the physical fitness? Um, some of it, yeah. Um, it's just it's what I I I I think being a part of so many teams growing up was such an invaluable part of my growth as a kid. Um, I think like every child should experience that. You know, you learn, you know, not just uh, the skills from the sport, but also like how to cooperate and still be competitive and have good sportsmanship and, you know, all these things that are going to take you really far in, in the adult world as well. Awesome. Um, and yeah. And so, you know, uh, I love joining leagues, even though like, because I'm never in one place for long, um, it's hard to commit, but beer leagues and like dodgeball in Vancouver and yeah, having cool. to try anything. Well, you've been, uh, you, you've said it, you know, you know, in your own words, you feel you've been very fortunate for what you've been able to do experience uh, in the poker realm. Do you have any sort of uh, bucket list or to-do list of achievements or, you know, even if not achievements, but like, oh, I also want to be on this show, like that sort of stuff within poker? Yes. So I think largely because of, you know, the imposter syndrome and not really knowing how long I want to stay in the industry for, for a long time. Um, I didn't really set any goals for myself. Mm. Um, but now I think, um, you know, I have some monetary goals as well as some, some achievement goals, like bracelets and, and things like that. Um, but I'm also not in like a huge rush. The monetary goals, you know, I think are okay to have if I'm playing cash games. Um, obviously there are things that are way beyond my control, um, but it's it's okay to, you know, set achievable goals just just so I have something to look forward to. And honestly, that has that has never happened up until like very, very recently, up until like the past couple of months or so. And what was it that uh was that catalyst for a change? Um, like I said, probably like just having more confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm running really hot on the stream games right now. Um, so if those opportunities keep um, popping up, I think um, it would be smart for me to keep capitalizing on, on them. Sure. Um, yeah, if I didn't have like a direction, which was often the case when I was younger, it, it would just be, you know, I would come to a game if they like asked me or if I just happened to be in town. Um, but now I think for the first time in my life, I'm actively pursuing these opportunities and, nice. you know, potentially trying to organize games and things like that. Awesome. It's a good spot to be in and I definitely hope, uh, you know, that success uh, continues on, the, on a great positive trajectory for you. Um, and with all of your involvement in poker power, something we've seen, uh, especially in the last couple of years, finally, at least, you know, again, I'm not, I don't think I'm projecting here when I say just there's a lot more activity as far as promoting women in the game, starting to see more women. And you know, we make it a, a very active goal here to try and have, you know, more than the 5% of, of women at the table we've got. Uh, you know, almost 25% women who are guests here on the Cards Chat podcast uh, try to do our part. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. You're episode number 99 and you're the 25th female player. I did check uh, earlier. Um, so we do make it a very active goal to, you know, just grow the game in general, but among women in particular. Obviously, you're, you're playing a, a very integral role in that as well with what you're doing with Poker Power. What sort of I guess, I don't know if there's a tangible types of uh, achievement unlock kind of a thing, but maybe a more of a general trend uh, would you like to see in the coming, you know, one to five years? Uh, for a woman in poker, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're on a really great trajectory already. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's been fantastic women's organizations since a long time ago, but um, I think... I'm very proud and honored to be a part of the Booker Power community because they are not endemic and, and they came in with all these resources from other industries and, and really um, was able to shine a, a huge focus flashlight on this issue um, and have mainstream traction with that. Um, I think this is just going to inspire more women um, at certain levels to play more. Um, I, 
I haven't really told a lot of people about this, but I also have intentions to start. I'm sort of like a micro, um, not really staking because I don't actually intend to make a lot of money or any on it um, at all, but sort of like a staking fund or something for female players, um, not at, you know, just that very small stakes and and just to give women the opportunities to, to get more comfortable and take shots and, and things like that. Um, and honestly, if you, if you look at the track record of like a lot of tournaments, um, especially like the, the local ones that, you know, women often have more time and, and resources to, to travel and take shots in, um, you see a lot of females with trophies, uh, this year. And I think that trend's just going to continue it, and it makes me really happy. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, what Jamie and the WPT are, group are doing is fantastic as well. Um, you know, Jen on the Public Power Advisory Board also uh, taught me that one of the best things you can do to get women into the game um, and elevate the overall um, level of female players is to um, build more prestige in, in female events. And so by having, you know, the win world championships, um, the ladies final table like being broadcast yep. um and having you know like a 2k ladies event instead of just literally the 1k yeah um, i think it's gonna help a lot with the cause nice plus the meetup game don't forget the meetup game yeah <laughs> it's super fun that's awesome. That's wonderful. And you heard it here first. You guys got, got to come to the Cards Chat podcast for scoops. Um, that's, that's, no, but like I remember, you know, everyone knows uh, when Nadia Magnus goes ahead and puts it out there uh, of like, here, here's some money. Who's, you know, yeah. who should we have in there? Tremendously successful initiatives well beyond just the one or two or three people who get to participate because it really just, you know, brings so many eyeballs, both men and women. So it's, uh, you know, great to to hear that that uh, tradition is going to be continued uh, by you, Shwan. Very, very good stuff. Um, last question that I've got for you before we move on to the community questions. It's something we always ask here uh, at the Friendliest Poker Podcast in town. Who is the friendliest player uh, who you've had the pleasure of competing with at the felt? Honestly, there's been so many, but a recent one that comes to mind is Michael Wang. <laughs> we both had like deep runs in a couple of tournaments and yeah he's just such a friendly cheerful guy to be around um awesome. another person probably brendan shack paris um an old friend of mine uh, also very much in the mixed game so. oh yeah sure well we, we gotta have them on gotta <laughs> gotta do some more <laughs> maybe in our in our second hundred episodes we'll have uh, michael and brandon on we'll work on that um so now it's time, you know, as we do in poke, you got to change gears. So in this segment of the show, we turn to you guys, our Cards Chat community, to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. Uh, and as always, a reminder, we have a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums for this. So as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send your questions in and for them. Just two question askers from the community today for you, Sean Lu, but they... Uh, they have uh, I don't know, about a handful of questions each. So we'll start with Chica Bonita, who wants to know, do you watch vlogs and streams of other players uh, on Twitch? And if so, who's and why? That's a great question. Um, admittedly, I don't actually consume a ton of poker content. Mm -hmm. Like I barely watch the streams that I'm on unless I'm just having a hand or something. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean I don't think that over content is valuable or good. Um, I there's just so much you know content out there and oh, yeah. so many different fields. Um, I always enjoy catching the highlights. To be fair, um, but I, I would say some of my favorite streamers probably Lex. I don't watch it that much, but I'll pop in once in a while. Um, Kevin, super nice guy. Um. Yeah, uh, Doc. She's part. Of, she's a poker power instructor based out of Vancouver, Canada. Is that Alice? She's Sh James Shawan. Oh, forget Shawan. Shawan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's how you say it. Um, you know, she's super smart, intelligent. She she has such an incredible life story. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, she she streams for pure beginners, which you know I think it's a it's a growing demographic for sure. Excellent. Very cool. Okay. 
Uh, next question from Chica Bonita. Uh, I guess the, she wants uh, your elevator pitch. Uh, Shwan, if you had to convince a person that poker is an amazing game that everyone should try to play, what would you tell him or her so that he or she would definitely want to play? This is an easy one. All um, right. You know, I work for Poker Power and our whole thing was, you know, you don't have to like the game. You don't have to play it for a living, but just just give it a shot. You know, it honestly combines um, analytical skills and, and people and um, psychology skills. Um, it really has the best of basically um, every world you can. Um, and you get to be social. You, you know, if you just want to be there to like hang out with your friends and chat, you can do that and, and take it easy. Um, or you can have a different approach and be super competitive. Um, and I think my favorite part of the game is just that it's it's so uh, democratic. You know, you can sit down at the ta poker table and literally have people from all different walks of life and countries and, um, you know, experiences. And you never know what you're going to get. And that's always been my favorite part. It certainly, certainly feels like you've a answered that question before. That's a good one. I like that. Uh, <laughs> no, it's good. It's good to have some easy layups as well for you. Could use that basketball metaphor. Um, last one from Chica Bonita. Uh, do you have a poker related dream? Uh, and do you have a dream that has nothing to do with poker? I guess things that you want to accomplish or fulfill. I'm assuming you don't mean like the literal like when I go to sleep dream because I no, do no, no. I'm like a, a, a like wish uh, an ambition type of um dream. Yeah. poker dream honestly is kind of poker but also not really um like this summer I played uh, the WSOP main event with um with someone who has his own uh, charity that helps homeless people and he donates every single penny that he makes from poker to these charities. Wow. Um, and yeah, I, I think the, the ultimate dream would be to only have to play as a rich business person mm -hmm. um, and not for a living and, and a significant portion of my income. Um, and yeah, and be able to donate every single penny to to causes I care about. I think that covers both the poker and the non-poker in that sense. Yeah, good, <laughs> exactly. Good answer and, and a great dream and ambition poker to have. Poker is life. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and we, now we turn finally to Acid Burn FX. Thank you so much for sending these in uh, for Shuan Lu. Um, <laughs> love, the, love the creative wording. It's just uh, a special talent for putting these questions together, Acid Burn FX. Shuan, if life is a video game what cheat code would you want to use most and why jeez um <laughs> i love it great questions what's the one where you can i mean the one that's most vivid to me that i loved using the most um you know when i was younger and more results oriented would be like the super mario one where you oh yeah have invincibility. The one where you can fly yeah. not the invincibility oh. that's just too op but the okay. one where you can just have like the raccoon outfit okay all the time and fly through like you can still die um but it just makes it easier and you can zoom past it um i don't know like when i was younger i, I always thought that would be my favorite superpower to just fly um because yeah, I you know, again, it goes with the freedom aspect and just having that like original unique POV um, seems pretty cool. Cool, nice, okay. Well, here's another sort of POV question for you uh, from Acid Burn FX. What would you do if you could become invisible for a day and why? <laughs> Definitely nothing creepy. Um, <laughs> invisible, I mean, I would just, Staying home and being off social media is like kind of the equivalent of being invisible, right? Interesting. Um, Anywhere you'd want to go and sort of be a fly on the wall and not noticed? It seems just too unethical. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like what I would even want to know. Like, because you, you can't really use that information. Right. Um, I don't know. Maybe it would be like, state secrets or something figuring out like why there's such like a whole huge homeless problem or you mm. know, if someone's intentions are really pure about something but right well that was sort of mine of like if, like if i could sit in on like uh i don't know a big cabinet meeting or like 
Right. Yeah, like, a, like the upper echelon of like a huge company, like the, you know, the higher ups and just sort of, you know, what is it that they talk about that the public doesn't get to hear about that? That'd be interesting to me. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But then, yeah. Yeah. If you got rich off that somehow. No, no, no. Just really be know. the only way that you could make use of that information, right? No. Because otherwise, gonna... if you try to like whistleblow or something, like you'll probably just get ignored. And... Yeah. But I just think it'd be cool just to, I don't even have that knowledge, even if you don't get to share it with anyone. It's just a cool experience of like something you did. You know, it's always like pics or it didn't happen. Well, maybe it doesn't need to be a picture. It could have <laughs> happened and, and you know about it. Um, we got three more for you, uh, Shuan. What is, uh, and you could pass on this one if you want. What is the worst gift you've ever received and why was it so bad? Worst gift? <laughs> Oh, I can't. Honestly, I have such an awful memory. I, I never think a gift is that bad because someone took the time to like, mm. you know, be considerate and think of you. Um, I guess it would it would be in spots at like at the poker table where like you're actually bluffing and then the guy's like, or the, the girl is like, okay, I know you have it, but here, here's the gift, like Merry Christmas. And then you're like, fuck, like, why did they call? Like, <laughs> like that. Okay, that's, that's fair. I guess it kind of dovetails into the next question is ish. Because uh, Acid Burn FX wants to know what is the biggest non poker bluff that you've ever made in your life? Non poker bluff. I mean, I was like, you know, a contentious teenager. So I would always, you know, my parents were separated from when I was a young age. So for like literally many years of my life, I would tell my mom I was going to my dad's and my dad thought I was going to my mom's and just like stay with my friends. You know, <laughs> kids, they, they did not communicate with each other. So <laughs> okay. that's interesting. It's funny that that's the first thing you thought of also. I guess that's uh, um, it mattered a lot at the time that, hey, you know, yeah. you, you got some freedom also from that as well to do your own thing. Very interesting. Um, and our last question for you, Shuan Lu, um, Acid Burn FX wants to know, I think, I, and I ended up with this one on purpose. I love this question. When was the last time you laughed so hard that you cried? Um. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it happens like quite often. I just can't pinpoint the exact reasons it happened, I would say. Probably like I'm very ticklish. So that's like a very, yeah. When, you know, I'm with my partner, I think that's a very tiny experience for me. Very easy for me to like drop a tear. Okay, that's cool. How about stand up, or does that do it? Not really as much as the. I, yeah, I I love um Ali Wong. Uh huh. Um, oh, uh, Nikki Glazier. Uh huh. I recently discovered those fantastic you know comedians. Nice. Well, very cool. Well, uh, guys, thank you very much for sending in your questions for Shuan Lu. Just a friendly reminder, again, one more time to all of you out there in the Cards Chat community, we would love to see you submit your questions for future guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Guys, please give us a good review on iTunes. Spread the word via your social media channels if you'd like the show. Shuan, before we let you go and, uh, you know, root on your favorite team uh, at the WNBA finals, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, it's been such a pleasure. Um, hope you guys keep supporting the show and, and myself and hope to see you guys around. And good luck at the tables. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for tuning in once again to another episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>